Definitely Good evening, that. everyone. Um, I hope you all can hear me clearly. Um, if you're joining in, kindly mute your mic um, and um, close your videos, except the speakers. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for joining in this evening, um, or whatever the time is where you are. Um, so today is the second part of the um, webinar series, and we'll be looking at um, the impact of societal challenges on ocular surface. Oftentimes, when we talk about um, ocular surface disease or dry disease, we think about things like medications, um, contact lenses, or certain systemic diseases. But we often do not talk about the impact of societal challenges, and today we'll be looking exactly at that. Um, I was privileged to, I'm very privileged to have served in this committee um, for the TIFOS Lifestyle um, um, Reports. Um, but today, um, we'll be giving the mic to Dr. Danielle, who also um, was a member, is a member of the Societal Challenges Committee. Um, Dr. Daniel is presently, he's an ophthalmologist, um, specialized in ocular surface disease. Um, he obtained his PhD from the University of Western Australia, and he currently researches um, the use of autologous stem cells um, for managing um, advanced ocular surface disease at the Lions Eye Institute and the University of Western Australia. Thank you so much, Dr. Daniel. I know it's pretty early where you are. Um, you can unmute your mic. I'd stop sharing my screen so you can go ahead and share yours. You have the floor. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction. Thanks everyone for joining and having me tonight. Um, okay. So I hope you can see my slides and hear me clearly. Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. So yeah, it's a great pleasure um, to be here tonight and presenting the results of our um, societal, societal challenges subcommittee of the TRP Monocular Surface Lifestyle Epidemic Report. Um, I have no conflict of interest to the any materials presented here tonight. So uh, at the beginning, I'd like to start with some definitions. Um, Pretty sure you're already familiar with these um, uh, terminologies, but just as a review, so um, the ocular surface is composed of the cornea, limbus, conjunctiva, eyelids, and eyelashes, lacrimal apparatus, and tear film, and also um, other glands and muscular, muscular, vascular, and lymphatic, and neural support. And when speaking of ocular surface diseases, we mean any established disease affecting any of these structures and also any responses to any of these diseases. Um, so specifically for what I'm going to talk about tonight, uh, we're talking about societal factors, which are uh, usually evaluated in at different levels. So the first level is the biology and uh, genetic factors. And also at the next level, there are individual lifestyle and societal factors. And there's also uh, another level, which is living and working conditions. And then there is socioeconomic and cultural and environmental conditions. And the recently added digital world, which includes information and communication uh, technology. So how this report was structured, um, there are two main parts. The first part evaluates the role of uh, different societal factors as risk factor for ocular surface diseases in those, uh, at those five levels that I've mentioned earlier. Uh, so as you might notice, lo lots of these conditions are overlap uh, with the other subcommittee reports that will be uh, discussed um, uh, next few days. Uh, but tonight I will be looking at all of these factors from a different angle, which is the societal um, aspect. So for example, when we talk about the digital world, the impact of digital world on the ocular surface, in the digital world subcommittee, they will evaluate the role of um, digital devices on the ocular surface diseases. But what I will be talking about tonight is mainly about the impact of digital world on the mental health or on the access to 
um, the, the um, um, care or services. And also about the climate change, uh, the other subcommittees will be talking about the impact of climate change on the ocular surface diseases. But uh, to, today it's about the, um, the impact of climate change on factors like poverty, access to healthcare or immigration or this kind of uh, conditions. And the second part is um, the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on the ocular surface, and it follows a, a detailed systematic review of the impact of COVID-19 on the ocular surface. So we'll start with biology and genetic factors, which is the first um, level of the societal factors. And uh, obviously age is the first factor that is uh, impacts, that can impact the ocular surface health and diseases. Um, so with the dry eye disease, the uh, results of different uh, investigations were controversial. And uh, most of the studies in African populations didn't show any significant association with the dry eye disease with increasing age. And that's mainly because of the increased incidence of dry eye disease in some um, younger population, probably due to the use of um, digital devices and some other risk factors that are involved. Uh, Meibomian gland dysfunction obviously increases with age, and most of the studies have shown this association with age. Uh, Demodex blepharitis is a specific form of blepharitis, uh, which you can see the nits or the mite itself on the eyelashes. And this form of blepharitis is significantly associated with the increase of age. Also, meibomian gland atrophy is also associated with age. So with increasing age, there's a higher risk of meibomian gland atrophy. Uh, conjunctive ocalysis is a loosening of the conjunctival tissue, as you can see in the picture. And uh, most of the studies have shown an increased prevalence and severity of conjunctival colitis with age. Pingacula and trigium, you're all familiar with that. Um, and uh, because of the uh, ultraviolet impact, so uh, almost all of the studies have shown an increased incidence of uh, pingacula and trigium with increasing age. Uh, also, coronal infection and specifically herpes zoster ophthalmicus are some types of infections that the risk of these infections increase with age as well. About the allergies, there's again controversies. So most of the allergies happen in the first three decades of life, but there are some types that are more common among older population. So um, the studies are not very um, com complementary about the, the, the impact of age on the ocular allergies. And also about the neoplasms, ocular surface neoplasms, almost all of the types of ocular surface neoplasms are more common in older population and there is a significant uh, risk of developing these neoplasms in, uh, uh, with increasing age. The next um, biological factor is sex and gender. Uh, it's been shown that both uh, sex and gender can impact prevalence of and severity and access to care and also seeking of care uh, for a range of ocular surface diseases. Um, in most studies, females have shown a higher risk of developing inflammatory and immune disorders of the ocular surface, like Sjogren syndrome and even non-Sjogren dry eye disease, um, as compared with the other adult males. Uh, but male sex was as in, was an independent risk factor for meibomian gland dysfunction and ocular surface squamous neoplasia. And the third biological factor is demographics. And I mean, with the demographics, we mean the uh, ethnicity, racial factors, and uh, ancestral history. But since in most studies, these factors are self-reported, so um, all, any conclusion should be made with caution. Um, in, in most studies, it has been shown that a, a Southeast Asian population have a higher risk of developing dry eye disease and myopenian gland dysfunction compared with Caucasians. And also indigenous populations have a greater risk of trachoma and onchocerciasis in most populations. But again, uh, there might be some confounding factors specifically for indigenous population, they might spend more, more time outdoor and there might be some other environmental factors 
that may um, contribute to the increased risk of ocular surface diseases in these populations. Uh, genetics and hereditary factors. So there is a moderate heritability for dry eye disease symptoms and prior diagnosis of dry eye by a clinician. And the uh, heritability for dry eye disease signs um, was variable in different studies from 25% to 80%. And uh, there was no impact of genetics on the on, on tear breakup time. Uh, some studies have shown that um, specific single nucleotide polymorphisms in the thrombospondin 1 gene, which is an important gene in tear secretion, might be associated with a higher risk of developing inflammation and dry eye after um, laser refractive surgeries. And also genetic factors might be involved in Sjogren's syndrome, allergic eye diseases, and neoplasms. But all of these diseases are multifactorial diseases, so there's no single gene contributing to any of these diseases. And if you're more interested to read more about the impact of genetics to the, uh, ocular, on the ocular surface conditions, yeah, I encourage you to read this paper, which has reviewed uh, the impact of genetic factors on the ocular surface disease in details. Um, there's a long list of comorbidities that are um, associated with dry eye disease and ocular surface diseases, and also um, these diseases are overrepresented in patients with dry eye disease. Uh, these comorbidities can be categorized in different types, and probably the most important is the uh, diseases that are, the, that are associated with altered immune function. Uh, these are just examples, but the list is um, very long, so if you're interested, I encourage you to read the actual paper, the review. Uh, so some examples include chronic renal failure, diabetes mellitus, malnutrition, autoimmune diseases, and, and allergic diseases. Another group of diseases that are associated with ocular surface um, problems include chronic pain syndrome. And, and all these patients with chronic pain syndrome have more um, pain perception, and they might have more ocular surface symptoms. And these diseases include um, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome, and irritable bowel syndrome. Anxiety and depression are risk factors for ocular surface diseases and specifically dry eye disease. Either the disease itself or the medications that are used to treat anxiety and depression can contribute to the higher risk of uh, ocular surface problems in these patients. Another independent risk factor for dry eye disease is poor sleep quality and insomnia. And also there are some specific systemic and topical medications that can increase the risk of ocular surface diseases, mainly proton pump inhibitors, anticholinergic drugs, and topical anticholacoma medications. So my colleagues in other parts will discuss these uh, comorbidities in more details um, in the next few days. The second group of societal factors that can impact ocular surface health are individual lifestyle and so social or community factors. And I'll start with nutrition, but again, uh, like about, um, about nutrition, um, my colleagues will discuss the impact of nutrition on the ocular surface, but tonight I will be focused on the societal aspects of nutrition. Um, so as we know, uh, food insecurity is one of the most important uh, societal challenges these days. It can be associated with unmet nutritional needs and, and uh, multiple deficiencies. Pro uh, vitamin and, and mineral deficiencies have been reported in patient, in, in those groups that experience food insecurity. And all these vitamins and minerals um, uh, can have deficiencies, can have ocular surface consequences. And different factors such as, po such as poverty, uh, climate change, pandemics, and mass immigration can cause food insecurity. Um, it, anorexia nervosa uh, is, is pretty common among um, young individuals, especially females. So it's been associated with lower blink rate, higher complete eye closure, and higher vitamin deficiencies that can cause um, eye surface problems. Uh, the effect of obesity and metabolic syndrome on, on the ocular surface was controversial, although obesity can, can be associated with thinner lipid layer and more meibomian gland dysfunction, but um, the rate of dry eye disease was not higher in this 
Um, group. Fasting, I believe you are in the last or maybe last couple of days of the Ramadan. Um, it has been shown that religious fasting was associated with a significant increase in tear osmolarity and ocular surface disease index and a decrease in tumor test results and tear breakup time. But um, the other type of fasting, like intermittent fasting for diet purposes, because it's it's uh, more flexible, these um, signs were not observed in intermittent fasting. Smoking cigarettes was associated with multiple ocular surface alterations, like reduced goblet cell density, abnormal coronal staining, and increased ocular surface signs and symptoms. But uh, population-based studies have not shown any significant association between cigarette smoking and dry eye disease. There might be some confounding factors, such as individual and social factors, that contribute to these controversial um, results. And also studies um, on e-cigarettes have shown the same thing, um, ocular surface alterations, but without any significant correlation with uh, dry eye disease or other ocular surface diseases. So further studies are required to uh, explore the exact relationship between smoking and e-cigarettes and ocular surface diseases. Um, about the exercise is another uh, individual lifestyle factor. Um, it has been shown that reduced physical activity was associated with increased dry eye disease, but after correction for other factors such as obesity and depression, this, this relationship wasn't significant. Um, but there was a significant relationship between aerobic exercise and improved shimmer test results and tear breakup time and reduced tear film inflammatory biomarkers. Uh, it has been suggested that exercise can stimulate the um, ocular surface parasympathetic activity and increase um, tear secretion. Um, about, um, about the use of alcohol, so it, it's been shown that uh, when administered orally, alcohol can be detected, ethanol can be detected in tears, so it can lead to multiple ocular surface abnormalities. Um, but the studies um, investigating the relationship between alcohol consumption and risk of dry disease were uh, inconclusive. And there were controversial findings among men, men and women, while some studies have shown protective impact in men, um, other studies have shown that in women, um, alcohol consumption was associated with higher dry eye risk. And well, we know that chronic alcohol consumption can uh, result in vitamin A deficiency and xerophthalmia. Uh, about the caffeine, we know that the ca that caffeine has a mild diuretic effect and it might exacerbate dry eye disease, uh, but there is little evidence to support this um, hypothesis. In fact, um, the available evidence shows that uh, caffeine might have a beneficial impact on the ocular surface by decreasing dry eye symptoms and increasing tear secretion and tear film stability. So overall, caffeine might have a protective effect by increasing um, tear secretion. Um, the effect of green tea was equivocal. It's, it wasn't harmful or beneficial um, in studied populations. Uh, the next... Um, individual lifestyle factor is recreational drugs. There are uh, quite a few drugs that has been discussed in this report. Um, one of them is opiate analgesics that we know that the use of uh, this analgesics has been increasing uh, in different fields, including ophthalmology for relieving post-operative pain or, or neuropathic pain. But uh, there's no um, uh, studies showing that the, there's any impact of opiate, uh, opiate analgesics on the ocular surface. For instance, um, morphine, either systemic or topical, didn't have any impact on coronal wound healing, um, but barbiturates and anxiolytics uh, could increase the risk of dry eye in patients with depression and anxiety. Marijuana, if it's smoked, can cause reduced tear secretion and increase dry eye symptoms. And also cocaine was associated with a decreased tear production and also decreased uh, blink rate 
increased neurotrophic arthropathy and uh, a risk of coronal epithelial defect and ulceration. And also there is a range of cultural and religious beliefs that can impact ocular surface health. And there's a very long list of traditional medicine and cultural practices that are uh, discussed in the paper. But some of the most important ones are, uh, one of them is breast milk. Um, so it, it might exert some um, antibacterial, antimicrobial effects through um, immunoglobulin A and other factors, um, enzymes, but also serious complications such as infection and endophthalmitis have been reported. Um, but most studies in animal um, models have shown that breast milk can promote coronal wound healing. Castor oil is another uh, traditional medicine which has been studied um, in, in some populations and a randomized clinical trial have shown that preocular use of castor oil uh, has improved blepharitis after four weeks of use and, and there has been some beneficial effects on tear film stability and across surface integrity. And th there's a long list of um, herbal medications and traditional medications uh, that has been used in, in the ocular surface. And although most of them have shown some beneficial outcomes, but um, serious complications also reported frequently. Sports-related injuries are other um, factors that belong to this uh, group of societal, societal challenges. So uh, most sports-related injuries happen in basketball, baseball, softball, and paintball. But in another study in Australia, um, sports like or recreational activities like cycling, football, tennis, and trampoline, fishing, and swimming were, were the most common causes of recreational and sport-related injuries. So it's also a local factor depending on the most common recreational activities. Uh, but these recreational traumas are nine times more common in males um, but um, protective measures played a key role in reducing these injuries. Fireworks are, are, are a major cause of um, recreational eye traumas and can result in major um, eye surface and, and, in general, ocular injuries. And also, toy guns can cause devastating eye injuries uh, impacting the ocular surface, especially with uh, ball bearing and pellet guns. Also, there are some recreational and sport activities that are related with excessive UV exposure, and these ones can also damage the ocular surface. Another important uh, community factor is um, societal support or pressures. So it's been shown that in, in many of patients who refer to the eye clinics, uh, one of the most concerns is a uh, disfigure, disfiguring eye conditions such as eye deviations, uh, use of um, eye prosthetics, prosthesis, and also ptosis or other disfiguring eye conditions. And they can cause uh, high distress and depression in patients. And although um, cosmetic surgeries can correct many of these conditions, but those surgeries also associated with a higher risk of ocular surface problems. And some of these cosmetic surgeries, cosmetic uh, procedures might have complex impact on the ocular surface, like with Botox injection, um, it can reduce the lacrimal gland secretion and increase tear evaporation. But on the other hand, if it's injected in the medial eyelids, it can decrease tear drainage and improve ocular surface um, conditions. Cosmetic contact lens, uh, I think uh, it's been discussed last night. It's more common in females and is associated with a range of ocular surface problems. And also eyelid tattooing, again, more common in females. It can cause um, contact dermatitis and meibomian gland loss and other ocular surface um, complications. Uh, living and working conditions can affect ocular surface as well. As well. So um, there are certain um, occupations that are associated with a higher risk of ocular surface injuries in occupations that deal with chemicals, corrosive agents, or excessive heat or mechanical trauma also those with uh, excessive exposure to sunlight or air pollution can cause more ocular surface damage or diseases. 
Uh, there's some certain jobs that are mentioned in this paper, like um, cleaners, miners, construction workers, agricultural workers, animal holders, and mechanics who are at higher risk for ocular surface damage. Interestingly, those who work in the office uh, due to the prolonged use of visual display terminal are at higher risk for developing uh, dry eye disease. And also unemployment can impact physical and mental health and consequently can cause a higher risk of dry eye disease and other ocular surface problems. Um, access to sanitation and clean water was associated with a lower risk of trachoma in endemic areas. And there are also other um, infections that are associated with um, water, um, mainly Acantomaba, Toxoplasma, Toxocara, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and other virus. Education, especially childhood education, is another important factor um, in ocular surface health. So education was linked to poverty, socioeconomic class, nutrition, and access to health service in um, it's an important determinant of ocular surface health as well. And it's been shown that low education was associated with poorer visual outcomes and higher infectious coronal blindness. And on the other hand, ocular surface diseases can also negatively impact the education by reducing uh, concentration and performance. Um, other factors such as poverty and low socioeconomic status um, can increase the risk of trachoma, fungal crotitis, and infectious coronal blindness, especially in low to middle income countries. And this safe strategy introduced by the, uh, the World Health Organization has been very successful in controlling trachoma, which includes um, surgery, antibiotics, facial cleanliness, and environmental improvement. Um, homeless people are at high risk for developing range of ocular surface diseases, and prisoners also um, have a higher risk of developing allergic conjunctivitis, tritium, and xerophthalmia. And it might be due to a lack of lack or delayed access to healthcare in prisons, and also lack of awareness, poverty, and low education. So the next group of uh, societal factors are regional and global conditions. Um, remoteness is, is a very important factor in access to um, healthcare uh, for ocular surface diseases. Um, so we know that those living in rural and remote areas have uh, uh, more outdoor time and poorer hygiene, and they might have decreased access to facilities. The prevalence of and severity of dry eye disease, myopomian gland dysfunction, and other uh, ocular surface conditions was higher in rural communities compared with urban areas. And indigenous people are also at a higher risk of um, developing trachoma, onchocerciasis, and tritium due to their remoteness and the higher rate of poverty. Also, some seasonal variations, like uh, in the spring season, allergic diseases um, are, are more prevalent or in winter, dry disease might worsen, and also in certain um, climates, conditions, uh, certain infections might be higher. Another factor is availability and affordability of services. So it's been shown that ocular surface symptoms and problems are among the most common uh, reasons for presentation at health facilities in low to middle income countries in both pediatric and adult populations. And we already know that in remote areas and in rural areas, access to tertiary care and ongoing, ma ongoing management is a challenge. So according to WHO definition, um, universal eye health is ensuring that all people have access to required promotive, preventive, curative, and rehabilitative health services of sufficient quality to be effective while also yeah. ensuring that people do not suffer financial hardship. So it's not just about availability, affordability is also um, important. And also cultural appropriateness is, is, is an important factor for delivering these services, especially to some specific populations like indigenous people. Uh, we know how women have less have more limited access to eye care, um, especially in certain regions, uh, due to some cultural factors, lack of independence, sometimes religious factors, and also limited access to female eye care providers. 
And also there are evidence that transgender individuals have uh, limited access to healthcare services. Uh, climate change may cause um, food insecurity and um, other um, societal challenges like immigration and poverty. And also conflicts are other factors that can affect a killer surface. And so refugees or those who are displaced are at higher risk for blindness and visual impairment. And the main cause of visual impairment in displaced refugees in African continent was cataract, glaucoma, glaucoma, and refractive errors. And we know that a very effective way to reduce these uh, visual problems in refugee population is um, adequate nutrition and access to sanitation. Um, violence is another factor that can affect ocular surface health. Different kinds of violence, uh, war, chemical injuries, and um, tear gas that is used in riot controls, rubber bullets, and domestic violence are different kinds of violences that can affect um, ocular surface health. And the next uh, level of uh, societal challenges is information communication and technology. It can be evaluated in two, uh, two levels. So the first one is impact of the um, communication and technology on mental and physical and social, social health. It's been shown that adolescents who use social media are at higher risk of mental health problems and decreased quality of life. But in adults, it depends on how they use the social media. So it can be useful or it can be harmful. Um, this information communication technology can also impact on access. So um, a, a great percentage of internet users use this medium for searching about the health information it can be seeking professional help or um, home therapy solutions. And also uh, telemedicine is something, especially in the pandemic era, it has changed the way that the um, health is um, provided. And the last part is impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, it can be uh, um, discussed at different levels, like the exposure to the virus or the full-blown clinical syndrome treatment and preventive strategies, personal uh, protective measures, and the policies, and access to eye care professionals and medications, and also increased screen time. In the, the last part of this um, uh, report was the systematic review, uh, which uh, finally extracted the data from 40 eligible studies and um, evaluated the role of the, the impact of COVID-19 on the ocular surface on four levels. The first one is the effect of screen time and online classes. The second is effect of face mask and other protective uh, personal protective equipments. And the third one is effect of COVID-19 infection itself on the ocular surface. And the last one is the effect of public health measures. So I don't go into the details, um, but as we can see, most of the ocular surface signs and symptoms have either worsened or didn't change during the um, COVID-19 as a result of increased, increased screen time or online classes. Similarly, the use of face masks and personal protective equipments has resulted in a worsened um, uh, ocular surface signs and symptoms in, in most of the populations. And the COVID-19 infection also either had no change or worsened the ocular surface symptoms in most populations. And finally, the public health measures like um, quarantine and staying at home also um, was associated with worsening of um, ocular surface symptoms in some of the studies. So as a conclusion, uh, definitely COVID-19 had some impact on the ocular surface and was uh, associated with a increased risk of developing new or worsening pre-existing ocular surface symptoms, but this relationship was complex and the and, um, conclusion should be made with caution. And the last part of this report is some general conclusions and recommendations. Uh, first of all, um, Societal, societal challenges are associated with both acute and chronic ocular surface diseases. 
for some of these uh, ocular surface diseases and some of these factors, this relationship is established like with age, socioeconomic status, uh, occupation, poverty, nutrition, and some of the other factors. But the other factors such as sex and gender, cultural and geographical factors, smoking, alcohol, this relationship might be confounded by other factors and the relationship is not very uh, clear. And also, um, uh, maybe these factors are a bit overlooked, but climate change, mass immigration, displacement, violence have a significant impact on the ocular surface health and should be considered in, in policy making. And finally, COVID-19 had definitely impacted, impacted ocular surface health in multiple ways, but the exact association um, needs further exploration. I wish I could say we are in post-COVID-19 era, but there are still um, quite a few cases, so there are still more patients with COVID-19. And thank you for attention. I would like to also thank um, the team, especially Professor Stapleton for leading the team and also other co-authors. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you so much, Daniel. Um, this has been very exciting and very educating. Um, there are a couple of questions in the chat section, so I'd read um, them one after the other, and um, you can just um, give your answers. Again, yep. I was in the committee, so I guess I can chip in where needed. Um, so I will go to the first question. Um, <clears throat> So I guess I can stop sharing my screen. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Um, so the first question um, says from your list, um, is pterygium and pinguecula dry disease? Um, I think you take that. Oh uh, yeah, it's, it's not dry disease, but uh, this report, the whole report is about uh, all ocular surface conditions, including dry disease and also other ocular surface diseases such as trigium, mybomian gland dysfunction, neoplasms, all kind of dry uh, ocular surface diseases. Yes, so I think the takeaway from that is um, pterygium is not dry disease, but it's an ocular surface disease. Yeah. Um, so the next question says, um, what is the relationship between insomnia and dry eye disease and how many hours is required, uh, how many hours of sleep is required in dry eye disease management? I, I'm not aware of any studies uh, studying the hours and the dry eye disease, but most um, studies at least recommend like an eight hour sleep for, for an adult, active adult. But it, it's really personal. But in terms of the impact of uh, insomnia and dry eye disease, um, it's probably a, a multifactorial if effect. Like um, those who have insomnia might have other problems that can contribute to ocular surface problems. Also, um, other conditions like floppy eyelid syndrome or like any medications can also affect dry eye disease in this specific group. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I think you answered that pretty nicely. Um, aside from um, probably the quality of sleep or associated diseases like floppy eyelid syndrome, which is associated with dry eyes itself, and things like keratoconus or papillary conjunctivitis and things like that. So um, sleep would affect dry eyes in a multiple number of ways. Mm -hmm. um, the next question is, um, can you further explain the relationship between chronic pain and dry eyes? So I think this person means the relationship between chronic pain syndrome and dry yeah. eye disease. Yeah, so um, patients with chronic pain syndrome, like fibromyalgia or irritable bowel syndrome, uh, it's believed that they have increased perception of pain. So they might have more sensitive nerve endings, including in the ocular surface. So even though the ocular surface disease might not be that severe, but they perceive more pain compared with other patients. 
So that's why they, they more tend to have more severe symptoms and less severe signs. So that's how chronic pain syndrome uh, is associated with um, dry eyes symptoms. Yeah. Yeah. And to take that a step further, would that also be somehow related to neuropathic cornea pain? Um, yes. Yeah. That, that's, that, there are different uh, conditions. Like, um, yeah, it's more neuropathic and related to, yeah. Okay. Um, so the next question is um, under the regional and global factors, are there specific statistics for Africans? I guess they're referring to the report. In the report, are there specifics um, for different races? Um, well, to, to my, uh, as I remember, I can recall uh, from my memory, there were a few quite a few studies from in, in African populations at different, like uh, in terms of the relationship between um, ocular surface diseases and sex or age or, um, but what was the question exactly about it? About the um, so looking at regional statistics um, specific for different regions, for Africa, for example, are there statistics under the, um, looking at the risk factors um, that are specific to Africans? Yeah, there are quite a few studies, um, but they were scattered in the paper. So yeah. at, at different parts, yeah, yeah they mentioned yeah. like um, in, in African population, this like in, about the yeah. sex, like male and female, there was a good study in, in Africa, which was, which showed that there's no relationship between um, sex and the dry or age and dry eye. Yeah, so I think um, um, in the report, um, we, although we did not group it based on the regions of the world, but there were certain risk factors that were more um, prevalent in certain um, areas. For example, he mentioned um, gender. Another thing that was peculiar to Africa was um, access to healthcare, um, seeing that there was a barrier to females who sort of had um, decreased independence, um, um, more poverty, tended to have more um, severe ocular surface disease. Um, it also touched on the use of traditional medicines in Africa. Um, so I, I think that was also in other parts of the world as well. They also talked about it in India and things like that. So yeah. there were some um, region specific um, 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 statistics. Um, I think one of the things that stands out in terms of region specific statistics is also the impact of war and conflict on um, ocular surface disease. And that um, was not just in Africa. I mean, there's war going on right now in um, Gaza, Israel. So again, these are things that we are specific to different regions um, and also Africa as well. So the next question, um, talks about how does wearing of face mask affect the ocular surface? Oh, sorry? How well, does wearing of face mask affect the ocular surface? Okay. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it affects in different ways, but the um, most important one is the airflow between the air mask, between the face mask and the ocular surface. So that's why, uh, so it's, it's mainly... Um, yeah, in because we healthcare professional used to wear face mask from before, so we knew how to tape the top part of the face mask to reduce the symptoms. So that's the main thing that I can say. But if you have anything else to add, um, well, I think the um, paper did mention um, that, and there was a term coined after the paper, mask associated dry eye disease. Yeah, uh, yeah. Again, it boils back to the airflow. The airflow increases, um, the backward airflow into the ocular surface increases um, tear break up, decreases tear break up time, um, increases symptoms of burning sensation and um, stinging and things like that. So, yeah, that's how um, wearing a face mask um, could affect um, or can affect the ocular surface. So as Dr. Daniel said, um, what you want to do is um, have the face mask taped, um, just pinch the tip of the nose there so you don't have that backward airflow going into the eyes. The next question looks at um, 
So the person says, based on cultural and religious beliefs, is there any significant impact of instilling zamzam water in the ice? I, mm, I don't think we've mentioned about zamzam water in this paper or no, if no. there is any studies. See, I haven't come across with any studies about. Well, I, ha I have seen a couple of studies, maybe one or two, that have tried to look at the impact of instilling zamzam water on maybe um, symptoms of the eyes or linking it to infections. Most of them mm. are controversial, um, inconclusive. Um, it's not like a rigorous clinical trial that was done. Yeah. So um, the jury is still out there. Um, but yeah, there is no specific clinical RCT study that has looked at that. So that could be something that um, um, should be studied, I guess, because it's... Um, yeah, I guess that's, that's the main problem. problem with the traditional and like um, cultural treatments. There's little... Uh, like randomized okay. clinical trials or well-designed studies. So that's m most of them. The results are inconclusive. All right. So the next question asks, um, what's the effect of climate change on um, dry eye disease? So, I mean, there's going to be um, tomorrow's webinar would actually um, look yeah. at this question. Um, so Dr. Penny will be talking about environmental um, changes or challenges. But um, I mean, I know we did touch on it a little bit in this um, um, report. So if you could just throw a bit of light on that. Yeah, from from that perspective that, I mean, it would, would be discussed tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's about the global warming, air pollution, all of these things can affect dry eye disease and in, in total the ocular surface. But in this report, uh, we looked at the environmental factors or, or climate change the way how it can cause societal challenges like poverty, like say immigration, mass immigration or displacements, right. like people may move from an area to another area. And when they move to another area, there's limited access to like clean water or maybe enough food or different things. So um, yeah, so that, that's how climate change can cause different societal challenges with the uh, ocular surface consequences. Thank you. Um, so the next question is, um, how does the level of education impact the ocular surface or affect ocular surface disease? Yeah, so first of all, I can say um, hygiene and then um, like seeking for professional care or um, seeking for like health care. So th those are the factors that are related to um, education. Yeah. So um, the next question looks at or asks, the next person asks, um, why are females more at risk of developing dry disease compared to males? I guess they're at risk of developing everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, except traumas and injuries. <laughs> Sure. Yeah, so uh, in, in general, if, if we could say generally, uh, it, it, it's not it's not really confirmed that female sex is associated with higher risk of dry eye disease, but certain types of dry eye disease, like inflammatory and autoimmune, like Sjogren's syndrome, or those associated with, say, other autoimmune diseases are more common in females, but say, like, meibomian gland dysfunction is more common in male. So uh, yeah, it depends on the subtype uh, on the underlying cause of the dry eye. So if it's autoimmune, yes, definitely it's more common in female gender because of the more common autoimmune diseases in female. And that's mainly and, associated uh, with the hormones, yeah. Yeah, and okay, yeah, exactly what I was going to say. I was going to say um, hormones um, definitely does play a role um, in um, that risk factor. Um, so again, before I say the next question, and I think this is something that um, most of the practitioners in Africa have seen a lot. Um, you have patients coming in who, um, where the mother or the grandmother has instilled breast milk into the um, mm -hmm. child, and that's a common um, thing. 
Um, so this person has a question. I have a follow-up question after that. So um, this person asks, breast milk is commonly used by mothers in Nigeria when their babies have eye infections. Does this traditional practice cause dry eye disease? Or I guess the um, proper thing should be, does this traditional practice cause ocular surface disease, um, which probably could lead to um, disease um, in adulthood as well? Uh, yeah, the, the breast milk uh, or like most of the other treatments, they don't cause dry eye disease. Um, most of them have some um, ingredients like breast milk specifically have immunoglobulins and cytokines, enzymes that are antibacterial. Um, but the point is that if it's not if it's not um, used in a like how to say if it's contaminated then it can cause infection and serious complications so it's probably more about how to use i, I can't i'm not against that so uh but it doesn't cause dry eye disease but all, all the complications that are reported it's related to infection um or like other problems and also if there is any condition that needs prompt treatments like with antibiotics and if you just use breast milk it can worsen the condition and yeah it definitely needs a more yeah. uh, prompt treatment so basically it could um, lead to eye infections especially when it's contaminated yeah. and um from an eye care perspective, how would you say um, what was the role of the eye care practitioner, whether an ophthalmologist or an optometrist or an ophthalmic nurse? What do you think we should be doing um, to stop such practices um, or to reduce the rate of complications that we see from such practices? Well, th that's exactly where education uh, plays a role. As like there is a question, there was a question about education. So I think where there is other treatments available, so it's definitely more, um, you know, it's it's better to use those treatments. Like I haven't mentioned, but in some Indian population, they use car urine as a drop. Yeah, for Ayurvedic medicines. Yeah, so it th th there was probably some beneficial effects, say, hundreds of years ago when there was no antibiotic or medication, there might be. But nowadays that we have access to antibiotics or better treatment, um, yeah, unless if there is a, a, a clinical randomized clinical trial that shows superiority of those traditional treatments over no treatment, otherwise we should discourage that kind of treatments. Yeah. Yeah, and I think again, education plays key role. So, yeah, for, for parents yeah. or yeah, yeah, I yeah, thank you very much for that. Um, I think again, the next question still circles around traditional medicines, but still, um, this is on castor oil. Um, mm -hmm. so I think basically this person is asking, um, because um, I remember from the report there was some benefit in using castor oil for patients who had um, blepharitis. But this yeah. person is asking, are we referring to topical administration or systemic use of castor oil? No, it's topical preocular administration on the eyelids, like uh, around the eye. So do you think um, that oral administration of castor oil may have the same um, benefit? Um, I, I don't remember, I don't recall anything. Yeah. So I, I, again, um, that's still um, unclear. Although um, there have been studies that have looked at using um, oral administration of olive oil um, mm -hmm. for, um, and comparing the change in tear break of time. I also remember the DREAM study um, that looked at omega-3s um, versus placebo. Placebo was sort of olive oil, but again, the placebo was not really placebo. It seemed like it was another treatment. Mm -hmm. So there may be some benefit in using oral administration of castor oil, but um, there are not too many RCT studies that have explored that. So that might mm -hmm. be another area to explore. Um, so the last um, question, um, 
goes back to um, MGD. So you did mention that um, males tend to have more um, MGD compared to females. So, so do you mm. um, want to expand on that? Yeah, it's, it's mainly uh, due to the effect of estrogen in females, which has a protective effect, and also androgen in males, which has a, um, negative. a negative effect on myopamine gland secretions. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting that after menopause, uh, men and women have the same risk of developing myopamine gland dysfunction. So when the effect of estrogens disappear, then the risk of myopamine gland dysfunction increases in female gender as well. All right. Thank you so much. Um, that was yeah, a very you. beautiful answer. Um, I think we've answered all the questions. Uh, we're so grateful for your time. Um, thank you so yeah. much for doing this. Thanks. Uh, yeah, so for everyone out there, um, just want to remind you, we'll be sending the recorded link um, later on. Um, we'll also be sending... Um, the survey from the um, CFU Ocular Surface Society um, um, practice um, survey. Um, so when you get that in your email, please do well to um, fill that link. Um, if you have further questions or further contributions, please send them in. Um, that's um, Dr. Daniel's email and that's my email. Um, you can reach out at any time and we'll be happy to um, answer your questions. Again, um, the recordings will be made available. And at the end of the webinar series, we will be sending the link um, to all the TFOS um, lifestyle um, papers. So you can read through the reports for yourself, go through the videos again. And again, um, we've noticed some gray areas coming up in terms of um, research. Um, that's areas that still need to be studied. So I think this is um, a beautiful avenue for eye care practitioners to take note of these things and then go further and explore. Once more, thank you so much, Dr. Daniel. We're very, very grateful for your time. Um, I guess you're going back to bed. Yeah. <laughs> Have a good Enjoy night. Enjoy the rest of your night. Yeah, thank you for having me. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thanks. See ya.